Welcome to our interview series, We Choose to Thrive, brought to you by Becky Norwood of The Woman I Love. We bring you stories of survivors who have chosen to heal, to thrive. If you are an abuse survivor and are starting or continuing your healing journey, these stories will provide hope, inspiration, and a knowingness that you are not alone. Join us in today's interview. So welcome, Roberta. Thank you for choosing to participate in We Choose to Thrive. We're so delighted to have you. Do you mind to give us a little bit of your story and what maybe even prompted you to join us on this, on this venture and um, where your background is a little bit, and then we'll go from there. So my story starts as a little girl and being terrified all the time of everything. Uh, I had a rageful father and a complicit mother and uh, just was never safe in my house, but didn't realize that till much later. There were some alcohol issues with my father and uh, I would say he was an alcoholic. He would say he probably wasn't. It was a constant battle of, I don't know if it was a battle of wills or, or what, but he was uh, full of rage and, and hit me a lot. And uh, it was all very difficult, and, but I only lived where I lived, so I didn't know that things weren't like that with everybody, so in everybody's house. And the big uh, turning point would be for me when, when I was 16 and my father tried to kill me. I, I don't think he would have meant to kill me, uh, but he was just full of rage. And I don't know why I would make that excuse for him, but I never, I, I just don't think that he, well, yeah, he realized what he was doing. But anyway, he was bashing my head into the floor and I was passing, I could feel myself passing out. And I knew that if I didn't get away, I would die right then. And uh, I ran out of the house with just the clothes on my back and no shoes and uh, wandered around until I, I don't even know whose house I went to to make a phone call to find my boyfriend to come pick me up. But there were no cell phones back then, so I had to have stopped somewhere. And my boyfriend found me wandering around um, and took me back to his dorm. He was uh, in his first year in college. And I stayed out of this dorm, and when I walked in, the resident advisor took one look at me, and I was so swollen and so beaten that they ran for ice, and they just they packed my face and neck and shoulders in ice and said they were going to call the police, and I begged them not to. And I ended up living out in his dorm room for a while, and I uh, drove myself into high school every day so that I would graduate. Wow. So there was, you know, that sounds very similar to uh, my own story. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, we... We face these kind of issues and we make the changes or we don't and we don't and sometimes even though we made we make ch changes in those moments the memories and the trauma of it can live for a very long time mm -hmm. so what so you made this amazing change when you were 16 did the change last did he try to seek you out um, were you able to just stay away from the whole process I did go home to get some clothes, and they, they wouldn't let me take anything. Well, they actually wouldn't let anybody into the house to help me take things, so I had to walk up and down the stairs and load someone's van with my stuff. I, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's still kind of a vague recollection of all that. There's, I, I have PTSD and, you know, like a lot of survivors do, mm -hmm. and so things are some things are hazy still, but I know that I ended up moving in with that boyfriend. I was still in high school, and we, and we were the caretakers of an apartment building, and he ended up being an abuser as well, and I write in my book about what's more humiliating, having your father beat you up or have you, having your boyfriend beat you up, and I decided that it was more humiliating to have my father beat me up, and I ended up staying with this guy for quite some time. 
actually. It's typical when we've grown up in a situation that's abusive that we attract the same thing because that's all we know. Well, it's familiar. And I think that at some point we don't feel deserving of anything else. Once we're cognizant of, well, this isn't a good thing, then, then we have to feel like we're deserving people to have decent people in our life. That's right. And so I continued to attract, I probably dated every abuser <laughs> or lived with, uh, and I, that's not so unusual, but there was a sort of an, a continual um, whipping up of drama in my life. You know, I just wasn't settled. So yeah. what was the turning point from that? I'm not sure what, what the turning point was. I, I just know that I, I tried to still have a relationship with my parents, still not knowing that this isn't how parents should be. And I, I spent a lot of time trying to stay under the radar, radar and trying to be a people pleaser, and trying not to piss anybody off. And it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And it, it really didn't matter because there was no consistent thing. There would be one day this would, would be a, a problem for my parents. And then the next time that same thing wouldn't be a problem. But what I did that wasn't a problem the time before would be a problem this time. Yeah. So, so you've, re you've even written a book, haven't you, to tell it to you? Writing your book, what prompted you to write your book? And what did writing your book do for you? I decided I wasn't going to keep the family secrets anymore. My parents were really beloved in the community. Everybody loved them. Mm -hmm. And the outward appearance to our family was we were this fabulous, middle-class Jewish family that, you know, we had all the right things and did all the right things. And, you know, the, the presentation was much, much better than the actual living arrangement. Anyway, I wasn't willing to sit with that anymore, that everybody thought everything was fine and we had such a great family. And meanwhile, I've got, I've been with the same therapist for 31 years. I've been digging in deep, trying to figure out my life and try, trying to understand the magnitude of PTSD and all the subsets of of the things that came along with that, the agoraphobia and the OCD and all the things that uh, were problematic in my life. So, so, where, so where are you now? What, did the book make a difference for you? Not at first. I wrote the book. It was really a tough, tough thing to do. It, was, uh, it took me a year. I would have to take breaks. I'd cry a lot. I thought it would be really cathartic, and it was just really painful. And... Um, I, I sent it off for a test read of, with about 25 people. Some I knew, some I did not. And two women called me and said, how do you know my story? And that's when it became cathartic. Mm -hmm. When people started contacting me and telling me how helpful my words were and how the explanation of my circumstances help them so much facilitate dialogue in their own life. And that was the point of writing the book. It was to promote healing and facilitate dialogue. The people most shaken by my book are people who knew me when I was younger. That's and, the case for me too. And that the people who would come over for Thanksgiving or whatever, and there was all this outward great family energy, and all I kept thinking was, please let this just, <laughs> let it not explode. <laughs> what would you say to somebody who's just beginning down this road of realizing that it's time they stop living the victimhood and, and stop being just a survivor and that it's time that they just heal and get better, that they, want, they feel something within their soul stirring, knowing that it's time to make some kind of change? What would you say? I would say, first of all, breathe. Breathe deep. Look into yourself and know that you're a good person and that you didn't choose this for yourself because nobody would choose this for themselves. Mm -hmm. But that takes a lot of work to get there. 
find yourself a really good trustworthy therapist broach this subject with the with trustworthy people if you haven't talked about it with anybody i didn't talk to anybody about it and my some of my closest friends were shocked by my book because it's not something i would ever talk about i was never i didn't feel safe enough most of us don't and and it doesn't surprise me because who wants to think about it <laughs> i mean really so i guess those were would be the first things I would say. And then the the most important thing is give yourself a break. Don't be so hard on yourself. I mean and love yourself, right? And and absolutely love yourself. But you know, not being hard on yourself, I, I think that from being a woman, we're self blamers. That's just the way we are. If something goes wrong, what did I do? What did I say? Even um, sexual abuse survivors think I leaned up just I must have leaned up just right I must have raised an eyebrow somehow I must have asked for this behavior we have to stop self-blaming and speaking from the men that I know in my life who have survived either child abuse or child sex sexual abuse there's an extra layer of shame being a man because you're supposed to be a manly man and you're supposed to be able to tough it out and, and it's, very, it's very debilitating yes for, it is for women but i think um sometimes men it goes that extra layer deep like you said yes exactly so i think that you really have to be gentle with yourself and and um change your self-talk oh how could i be so stupid how could i you, you have to stop those kinds of things. And those are all old tapes that run in my head. There's like a little teeny voice in the back of my head that says, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, and I think that that's partially because you're protecting yourself and, and partially for self-preservation, that you're minimizing the experience so it doesn't feel so terrible. Did you find that there comes a point where it's time to put the story away? I mean, not that you you get put the story away that you don't share it with somebody that really needs to hear it, but put the story away to where um, you can live a happier and richer life. Well, I I never talked about it until just recently. Yeah. Yeah. Until recently, so that's that hasn't been my experience. I Have certainly don't talk it? about it with yeah. everybody. Have you felt found a healing from sharing your story? Yes. Very good. That's that's what I, I think the way I meant to ask the question was. Okay. I understood it a whole other way. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. So for me, the, the healing power of telling our story is is amazing. Now, yeah. you just don't go and tell it to everybody because there, there are people that will totally discredit that. But for the most part, standing up and telling our stories is what gives us the strength. It helps us to put the pieces of the puzzle together. It, mm -hmm. us, it gives us a voice that may, maybe for, for much of the time we didn't have. And right. we begin to understand a lot of pieces about ourselves, which, which promotes healing, you know? Yes, exactly. And it, um, what I always tell people is I, I want to stand in my truth and be my authentic self. Mm -hmm. And this is for the first time in my life that I get to be me and I get to say what, you know, say the things I need to say and have a backbone about it. Well, I am, I'm enjoying hearing you speak this because I just turned 60 and on my 60th, for my 60th birthday, I published my book. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I've been growing and changing little by little over the years. Mm -hmm. This standing up and saying this story and and sharing it writing my book has been life-changing for me absolutely you know I, I totally understand i would my first podcast that i did with um the girls hour um they they have been they were amazing during my podcast and and one of the women told the story about uh you know we were talking about standing in our truth and she tells the story of the hula hoop and if you have a hula hoop and you're playing in the hula hoop and and it's going round and round and round 
you're still standing in the middle of your truth. Sometimes it's to the right, sometimes it's to the left, but you're still <laughs> right in the middle, <laughs> keeping the loop going. And I love that story. That was really one of the most amazing things I had heard. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to use that now. Because that's really what it is. So that was called Girl, Girl's Power? The Girl's Hour. Hour, okay. Um, it's a LGBT, it was an LGBT focused website, podcast, radio show. They, they are out of New Jersey and they, they have a radio show in Australia. Mine was the first book they took mainstream, which I couldn't be more honored or thrilled. Very cool. So. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. And oh, thank you. what our goal is here is for everybody to, to, for as many as possible, to stand up and share their story. Our main purpose is that we can be a voice of encouragement and a way for others to stand up and start finding their voice, too. You know, and I think Absolutely. together we can heal because as we lock arms and, and support each other, then that's where the strength comes from. So Absolutely. Very, very much appreciate your taking the time and, and agreeing to being on our interview. <laughs> I was very excited you asked me. So This story was brought to you by The Woman I Love at www.thewomanilove.com. If you are starting down the path to healing, no matter what stage, our united message is that you are not alone. We do not want to live with a victim mentality. We choose to thrive, and as such, we are joining hands to spread the message that you too can heal and thrive. Will you join us as a force of change we need in our world? Only by healing, growing strong, and uniting. Can we create the awareness of this terrible epidemic that is plaguing our world? We heal in many different ways. There is no one right way to heal. But the right thing to do is to heal. Heal for yourself, for your families, and for our world. Will you join us in this We Choose to Thrive revolution? Reach out to us at www.thewomanilove.com. Also, check out the incredible resources at www.rainn.org. And if you are actively facing abuse in this moment, do not delay. Seek out help in your local community immediately. Here is to your wellness, healing, and thriving.